Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, dear alumni, dear friends, dear partners of the MCI, I'm pleased and honored to welcome you today to this uh, distinguished guest uh, online live talk. And I'm especially honored to welcome a very, very distinguished guest uh, for uh, for the next uh, couple of uh, minutes and uh, this hour, let me uh, give a warm, a very warm welcome to the former president of the Republic of Croatia. Nowadays, IOC member and in many more functions, let me express my gratitude that she is here to President Kolinda Kraba Kitarovic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Altman. Thank you, Andreas. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you for your kind invitation for me to participate in uh, today's discussion. Of course, I would have uh, much more preferred to have been uh, in person with you uh, in Innsbruck, but I hope that we will see each other sometime uh, in the future soon. I hope I'm not confessing a little secret that we've been trying for quite a long time to 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 get together, but COVID, uh, among other difficulties, has has made it difficult to bring you on campus. But we will do uh, we'll be we will be doing our best to uh, bring you as soon as we can. And thank you so much for willingness to do so. Thank you. Yes, it's been actually two years since I promised that I would come uh, to campus. Uh, so I hope that uh, come this spring, uh, we will be nearing towards not the end of the epidemic, but at least uh, the way that we have been handling it so far that um, life will start to return to uh, some kind of a semblance of the old normal. And where are you now, Madam President? Where are you? Right now, I am in Zagreb. I am at the Zagreb School of Economics and Management, where I work. Um, it's my pleasure to, to work with everyone, especially with students, with young people. Uh, as I, I work as international advisor. Uh, and uh, I am actually getting ready this week to travel to China, to Beijing, for uh, the Olympics uh, as uh, an independently elected member of the International Olympic Committee. And you have been rightly mentioning the Zagreb School of Economics and Management, one of our uh, distinguished partner universities. We have been working together for a long uh, time, very successfully, and we truly appreciate to strengthen the connection also uh, for this live talk and uh, the connection we have been establishing a couple of years ago uh, with you, um, uh, Madam President. Thank you. Now we have been uh, we have been agreeing upon a very very topical uh, topic, um, and it is on European democracy, and whether the European democracy can be, shall be, is potentially already a leadership model for the world. But before entering uh, the, this uh, topic. Uh, and giving you the opportunity to uh, give us a little uh, keynote or some words on it, I would like to uh, say some words uh, about you and Thank also you. Uh, uh, encourage the audience to bring in questions. There is the opportunity and not just the opportunity, we are very pleased and, and, uh, and uh, invite you to put forward questions, send them to livetalk at mci.edu. I repeat, livetalk at mci.edu. And the questions will be coming on my screen. So please apologize if I once, uh, once in a while also have to look at my screen to see where the questions have been, um, have been coming in. Now, uh, you have been, uh, Madame Kolinda, the fourth and first female president of the Republic of Croatia and were in office from 2015 until 2020. And you also have been the first female assistant secretary general of NATO, and all, again, very topical, I assume, uh, for, for this live talk, as well as Croatia's first female minister of foreign affairs and ambassador to the United States of America. Parallelly to your diplomatic and po political career, you have been vigorously pursuing an academic career in government, international relations and security studies at the Vienna Diplomatic Academy, 
at the George Washington University, at Harvard University, Johns Hopkins University. So I, you are a co-alumna uh, to, uh, to, to my academic career and the University of Zagreb. But uh, how did you come uh, about to, I mean, to, to, to go into such a career? Was this planned or, or how did it occur? It wasn't planned. Uh, when I was um, uh, a little girl, it was the time of the former Yugoslavia. So obviously quite a different system from what we have today. Uh, it was, um, people don't like to say behind the iron curtain, but somewhere in between, uh, we, we can certainly say. And I always dreamed of traveling the world and working in the diplomatic service. At that time, for me, it was unimaginable to work for the Yugoslav uh, diplomatic service. So I thought that I would be working for the United Nations. And my plan was to study the languages and then to enter the structure as an interpreter or a translator and climb the ranks of the United Nations and work uh, in uh, international security policy, international relations, etc. But then with um, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the external circumstances for Croatia's um, decades and uh, centuries a long desire for independence, uh, we're ripe uh, for us to achieve that goal. And I joined the movement for independence. I started working for the government. I started working for the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology at the time and then transferred to the foreign ministry. And then that's how it all started. Um, I became a professional, a career diplomat. But um, throughout the process, I became also politically engaged because I was unhappy with the circumstances surrounding me. So the way to deal with the situation is to do something to start changing those circumstances yourself. And I uh, ran for parliament, was elected in 2003, um, then became the first minister of European integration and then foreign affairs and European integration, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, each time I would leave politics and go back to the diplomatic service, I would say no more politics. And then I would be persuaded again to come back and again to try to foster change, uh, to bring about change to move forward uh, and uh, to, to bring about not just leadership, but also transitional management. Because today, you know, they say that there is a huge difference between leaders and managers, that uh, great leaders can uh, not necessarily be good managers and vice versa. But I think that both uh, um, leaders have to study management and managers have to study leadership. And in today's world, it's necessary to be good at both and uh, do whatever we can in order to improve uh, the way that we do work, but also to improve the circumstances around us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for giving us insight. Now, was there one or two very decisive moments in your career where, when you say that really had a great impact on my decision, on my life, on the on the route I wanted to go? Or was it more or less uh, streamlined, uh, you know, either planned or falling from one step into the other? Or was there really something which may perhaps really influenced your, your, uh, the way to go? Well, there were all sorts of circumstances. Of course, there were inflection points. The reason why I became politically uh, engaged was um, I was in Ottawa, in Canada, deputy chief of mission at the time from 97 to 2000, and we had a change of government. And uh, the new government who came uh, into office, they, they were prone to all sorts of um, misperceptions, misconceptions, labeling people as a per um, not only political affiliation, but even personal affiliation, etc. And they came in with a lot of prejudice. So one of the things that I had to do is um, I was pregnant. It was a difficult pregnancy. Um, I was, my blood pressure was going up, so it was very dangerous for me to travel. But nevertheless, people at the ministry decided to bring me back. Although I could have fought the decision because as per Croatian legislation, you're not allowed to transfer a pregnant uh, woman for fear of discrimination to another place of work. But nevertheless, you know, my uh, 
goal at the time was to uh, first of all take care of the life uh, of my baby and of my own life i went back to croatia and then i saw that i just did not like the way that the government was using uh, that window of opportunity that opened up for croatia at the time so i ran through the election and uh, i um, shortly afterwards became uh, uh, as I said, first Minister of European Integration, then Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration, and had that great honor and privilege to participate in Croatia's EU and NATO accession pass. I was actually the minister when we opened negotiations with the EU, having resolved the difficult questions in cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal and many other um, uh, questions. Those were times of uh, of great progress. And then there were times when I would be in disagreement with people who uh, were members of my own party. And for me, I would never talk publicly about that. Uh, I believe that just like within one's family, you have to resolve uh, the issues internally. And if you're not able to, I decided to take a step back and uh, take a break from the national career. And that is when, from Washington, D.C., where I was ambassador, I applied for the position of NATO Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy, which was a public competition that anybody, um, any national of NATO could apply to. And I won through, I was selected through three tough days of selection process and testing. I was very proud of that and worked at NATO at, very, at a very important time of change. It was the time of the, the intervention in Libya, but also uh, what, what I thought was very important for me to do is the work in Afghanistan. And uh, I'm, I'm really saddened to see the situation today because we were doing so much, not just to provide for security for, uh, from um, military attacks, uh, an armed conflict, but um, I really put in a lot of effort to encourage women and girls to fight for their education, to bring the broadband internet to more than 20 Afghan universities at the time, mm -hmm. to provide for the circumstances and opportunities for women to study and work online. So we were really changing things. And then as um, president, you know, when I ran for the presidential election, I must say that uh, it took um, a lot of arguments and a lot of pressure from my party at the time to run for president. I thought it was a little bit early for me in life, um, still young, 53 years old. Uh, however, it happens. Uh, and um, uh, well, life takes you sometimes um, strange places. What I do is um, I've always thought that carpe diem, seize the day, uh, should be uh, my motto and to make the best of any circumstances that I found myself uh, in, whether be it um, a, a, a victory or something that I have succeeded or perhaps something that I haven't quite succeeded uh, mm -hmm. to do, however, um, to uh, learn the right lessons and apply them in the future. Now, coming to the topic of uh, Europe, European democracy, is European democracy a leadership model for the world? Can it at all be? What would you say? I strongly believe in the European democracy and the fact that we are challenging it in many ways proves its value. Now, I talked about inflection points in my own life. And I would say that a lot of people now talk about inflection points um, in the world and geopolitics and, and where the world is going. Uh, obviously, after the end of the Cold War and uh, several decades of uh, American primacy and one superpower, we have moved from that unipolar structure to a uh, more fragmented distribution of power structure. And geopolitics today is marked by the shift of power towards the East, towards Asia, and in particular towards China. So we see the world today that is divided, not just as for formal alliances, such as uh, the NATO alliance or, or other alliances, but we also see divisions in the interpretation of human rights, 
of the rules-based order of democracy itself, et cetera. So in contrast to what um, some were saying, um, in particular, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, Professor Fukuyama, about the end of history and uh, the victory of liberal democracy, now it is being challenged by uh, some superpowers uh, and uh, a number of other countries, whether it is the best model for the world, whether we can have a one-fit-all model, uh, or um, should the rules-based international system be based on rules defined by certain entities or certain countries, or do we already have it in the form of the United Nations or the United Nations Charter, which should be the premise of international relations? Now, as I said, I strongly believe in the European democracy. And as we have seen in, in our own transatlantic alliance uh, in NATO, uh, we've had many disagreements um, um, during uh, the past administration, the administration of President Trump and uh, the mutual relationship was heavily strained. Um, the uh, past uh, two years, however, have not been easy either uh, because of the pandemic that has, that has radically altered the way that we live and the way that we do business, including politics. We, we don't meet as much and personal meetings are very, very important because it's difficult to have a coffee break uh, via screen as, as as we're talking, you can only go to your own kitchen and make yourself a cup of coffee. But when you're together in the same place and you're meeting other people, a coffee break, you know, 20 seconds, a minute or two of honest conversation can actually mean a huge step forward in international relations. I think what Europe has learned in the past few years is that we cannot take it for granted that uh, the European interests or even the European definition of democracy and of uh, mutual relations uh, uh, will always be synonymous with those of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. And this is the time for the European uh, Union to sort of redefine uh, our interests and to develop new strategies and new tactics in order how to develop them. One can still question whether the EU is a political power and uh, how limited it is uh, when it comes to international relations and the global system. A lot of people will say that the EU does not create a reality in the international system, but that uh, reality is rather created by others. But um, as we have seen with the developments um, on our eastern flank uh, in Ukraine in particular, on our southern flank with the uh, migrations and unrest in the main uh, Mediterranean uh, and North African region, with the migrations uh, coming from Central uh, Asia or, uh, the, well, uh, the, from the area of Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, with a pullout from Afghanistan, the uh, situation is, is becoming complicated. And then we get to China, and the situation in the South China Sea, uh, the issue of human rights in China, the status of, of Hong Kong, uh, um, the situation with Taiwan, and uh, many other aspects where I think the European Union can really be a leader uh, in terms of becoming uh, responsible uh, and confident partner to all, a forward-looking and outward-looking partner. I think that so far in the past um, years and decades of the existence of the European Union, we have been, as a union, too much oriented inwards. And with the pandemic, uh, the, uh, that inward orientation characterized also individual societies uh, and countries. And we have seen the rise of nationalism, populism, xenophobia, but also um, things such as vaccine nationalism, uh, COVID nationalism, etc. That is all affecting, um, what I, I think, one of the underlying values that uh, is at the base of the European Union, and that is solidarity. Solidarity that, that goes multiple ways within the European Union and then outward as well towards the region that we, I believe, should feel more responsibility for in order to resolve uh, the, the root causes of conflict and of other 
uh, circumstances that bring about uh, problems and challenges for the European Union, but also to a lot more actively participate in building this new world order in um, working towards an international system that would be based on multilateralism and that would certainly be rules-based uh, international system. I see huge opportunities for the European Union. I'm very hopeful, but we do have to get our common foreign and security policy in order. So far, we've seen mostly the dominance of national foreign policies rather than this common policy. And uh, I, I hope that we will moving in, be moving into that direction. Uh, thank you so much for for this uh, keynote and for your thoughts. And uh, you've been mentioning Fukuyama, uh, the politic political scientist, uh, having the 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 idea that uh, the the lib liberal democracies would now be more or less present all over the world and spread out. And within Europe, uh, they they may be granted, may be given. And now, if we look uh, um, into into Europe, into certain countries, uh, the the this democracy model is somewhat questioned, if not to say at risk. Uh, then we have social media putting uh, a lot of uh, new aspects to it uh, because you perhaps cannot reach. Uh, uh, certain uh, parts, certain segments of the population anymore. They stay within their silos and and uh, and uh, strengthen themselves in their views. And also, we have, uh, for instance, uh, diff uh, risks coming from the outside of uh, Europe. And you have been mentioning the pandemic. To put it together, aren't the elements putting democracy, liberal democracy, in general? and especially the European democracy model at risk. Yes, certainly. And I think that the biggest danger for the European Union, for our cohesion, but also for the trans transatlantic alliance for NATO, is uh, are these um, uh, inter uh, internal disagreements. They are always corrosive uh, of uh, any kind of alliance or any kind of structure, any kind of organization, or even a family. So what we have seen the differences in the European Union when it comes to interpretation of democracy. Uh, and we have seen some um, countries take a few step backs on that road. That is very damaging uh, to the European Union and that is very damaging also to um, the, uh, the image that the European Union has in the world uh, as a role model. Now, um, you've mentioned social media, and here we have, on the one hand, the communications revolution has brought about huge opportunities. For citizen journalists, everyone can disseminate any kind of news from your home just by clicking the mouse button or the keys on your keyboard. You can send out any kind of narrative. So it has democratized the space, but it has also become a huge danger in the selection of that information. And it has also provided any kind of uh, not so well-minded individual with that power to create their own realities, their own narratives, and to disseminate them. And then to question not just the roots of liberal democracy, but to question science today, for instance. And we see that in this debate about COVID, about vaccination, about how to proceed further. Now, I have to say that the European Union still has huge power of attraction that we have not used to the uh, fullest potential. When Croatia wanted to join the EU and we were um, fighting or arguing to begin negotiations and even conducting ne negotiations, throughout the process, the support for EU membership in Croatia dropped very much from over 90% to barely above 50% at certain points. And that was very dangerous, not because we believe that the future of the EU, uh, the future of Croatia must be in the EU and must realize that, but that was dangerous because we were losing the hearts and the minds of people for what we needed to do, the tough uh, work at home, which is not always popular.
when you change your legislation, when you have to introduce new laws, new rules, transparency, fighting corruption, uh, democratic institutions, market economy, all of it is very difficult and that is why you need the support of people, the support of a population. On the other hand, the EU has not used that power of the Europeanization process, the power of that idea to foster more change. I look at um, our neighborhood in Southeast Europe nowadays. We um, have been stalling that, um, what they call EU enlargement process, and I prefer to call it consolidation because this, uh, this whole area really is part of the European Union, so it just needs to be integrated consolidated in the European Union. I just don't like calling it Western Balkans because I, I believe that nobody wants Balkans in their own house or in their own yard. Uh, and I prefer to call it Southeast Europe. And by no means is it a backyard of Europe. It's not even a front yard. As I said, this is part of Europe that needs to be integrated and consolidated. But waiting for so long uh, for these countries to make mm. progress, as imperfect as they are in their domestic work, in, in their reforms, has created a dangerous political vacuum that is being mm. filled by questioning uh, the value of the European idea, whether the EU really wants these countries, whether we want these countries, no matter what they do and how well they do. And it has provided the space for um, third parties who, again, are not necessarily benevolent minded towards the region to influence uh, the processes and to stall the enlargement or the consolidation of the European Union and uh, NATO in particular. So Europeanization uh, has huge power. And in those times when uh, the support for the EU in Croatia was dropping, I would argue to our population, look, whatever we're doing, we're doing for ourselves, for the benefit of Croatia, of our citizens, of our system, our democracy. And also um, the, the fact that um, the EU model is so highly regarded, uh, is uh, testified by how many countries still want to join the European Union or uh, cannot join because of geographical distance but want to. Uh, belong to some kind of uh, closer connection with the EU. And of course, um, as we have seen in uh, the migration uh, of uh, population from uh, all parts of the world, is that huge numbers of people want to come to the European Union. Everybody, of course, has the right to a better life. Unfortunately, the EU does not have the absorption capacity for all of these people to provide them not just with a home and safe haven, but with jobs uh, and uh, complete integration in our societies. Um, so um, it, it is a very difficult process, but that is also the testimony of the value of the European project and its attractiveness around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so but much. However, what, what I must underline is that we have to pay more attention to domestic res resilience, resilience of our own societies and resilience of countries who have sort of backed away from the previous commitments uh, and uh, the reforms that they were conducting, the democratic reforms uh, throughout their accession process. Mm -hmm. You've been mentioning a, a number of, 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 uh, of arguments and issues now. And uh, one, um, uh, one question which has, has come in in the meantime refers to, to these uh, arguments. And it's, it, it is, uh, the, the question comes from Monica Phillips. She's an MCI alumna in uh, sitting or living in Dresden, Germany. And uh, she asked me, would you, uh, Madame Colinda, agree to uh, the statement that uh, in social media it's not the best argument uh, which counts, it, it, it is the loudest argument? And how would you see that? Yes, unfortunately, clickbaits, uh, you know, the number of clicks. Um, that has influenced the traditional media a lot, that they will not serve you with the uh, most relevant information, but they will serve you with, as you said, the loudest information that will attract you to uh, look at uh, specific articles or, or portals or, or specific media. So the, the 
how how do we regulate that? That that is a huge huge question. You know, remember, uh, of course, all the social media are privately owned. However, so is the mainstream media, the print media, and we've managed to regulate that in a way that we try to uh, look at information that is credible and influences the credibility of every journalist. And uh, you become accountable through what you publish, even before the judiciary system of your own country or, or other countries. But how to regulate social media? I remember when um, Twitter kicked uh, the former President Trump um, for life? And then I think that the questions that were asked in Europe were a lot more pertinent than the ones that were asked in the U.S. Because, you know, whether one uh, agreed or disagreed with what President uh, Trump was saying at the time, uh, it was the issue of who is the authority who decides to mm -hmm. kick someone off a social platform that is a private platform, but nevertheless has huge public uh, influence and creates public opinion uh, and uh, influences security and stability of entire nations, institutions, etc. And how do we regulate that media space? So that will become very important. And to add another dimension is um, the area of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm which is now being used in the weapons system and which is changing also the nature of warfare, but the nature of how we uh, do work in general. It's uh, changing the nature also of the job market. And this pandemic together with uh, artificial intelligence uh, and technological revolution has, called, uh, has uh, caused huge shifts in the labor market, uh, but in the skills market as well. A lot of people have been out of job. Others have to go back to some kind of training or school in order to shift to be able to continue working. So how do we, re we regulate that? And, and quite honestly, I am um, in support of some kind of uh, global uh, regulation of at least the basic rules of application, um, not just social media, but more importantly, artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence can actually produce physical damage and can um, uh, in contrast to social media that can stir people uh, to to become terrorists, uh, etc., uh, artificial intelligence can actually target uh, individuals and whole areas. And uh, as I said, has been changing the nature of warfare. And then we'll have to deal with uh, space. We'll have to deal with the Arctic, etc. So a lot of lot of issues are opening that are ahead of us. But I think at the heart of all of this is, is really where does the so-called liberal democracy go? How do we continue to argue or kind of repackage it or reshape it? As today, there are, there are no longer fixed sets of like-minded countries in the world. And I think that the EU shouldn't be looking just for the formal alliances, but should be looking at aligning with certain countries when it comes to some specific uh, aspects of what we're dealing with, whether it be migration or social media or artificial intelligence or uh, rules-based international trade, etc. I think we will have to be a lot more inventive, a lot more active, and a lot more agile in the future in order to be able to face the challenges that are ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Now, you have been mentioning uh, certain elements or certain uh, certain um, certain experiences we, we've been having over the last two years where nationalism uh, again uh, created some or got some uh, some importance again, uh, especially when it came to vaccination, who gets vaccination first and how do we go to get and will we close borders or not or and, and so on. So uh, nationalistic um, experiences we have been facing. Will you think, and this is the question coming from Susan Blinding, she is an MCI student presently in Rotterdam, I think at one of our partner universities. Anyhow, she, 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 uh, she wonders 
whether the, the present Ukraine cre uh, crisis will perhaps have a positive impact on the European solidarity. Will it bring the European countries, the countries within the European Union stronger together? Uh, yeah, that is a very interesting question and a very pertinent one. You know, when we look at the pandemic, for instance, on the one hand, um, it has, um, of course, um, caused um, economic downturn and social distancing. Um, but it has also um, acted, as, acted as a catalyst and it has speeded up some of the processes and digitalization that had been in the making for decades before that. And uh, uh, dealing with the pandemic was a lot easier because we had that proper technology and we were able to continue working on it with respect to e-school, e-telemedicine, etc. And I think that this Ukrainian crisis might be the catalyst that we need in order to forge a more robust uh, common foreign and security policy. As uh, I mentioned earlier uh, in my remarks that we badly need it. You know, we have here uh, in the territory of Croatia, unfortunately, we don't have good memories of what the EC at the time was doing in Croatia. Basically, Europe was powerless in the face of war in Croatia, powerless to stop it. We were pleading uh, to stop the war in Croatia. We were heavily out armed at the time. We managed to defend ourselves, and then, of course, the war spread um, the aggression in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, later on in Kosovo, etc. And the United States stepped in at one point, and NATO intervened uh, first in Bosnia and Herzegovina and then in Kosovo, and together with the movements on the ground and uh, uh, the operations, I don't want to go into detail, but it fostered a date peace accords and we achieved at least peace uh, in uh, Southeast Europe. Now this might be uh, an opportunity to see how our crisis management works, how we communicate during a crisis like that, and how we take these decisions very quickly. To compare it with NATO, it took NATO to agree to, um, you know, months and actually years to intervene in Bosnia and Herzegovina and then in Kosovo. But it took NATO, I, I believe, about 17 days altogether to agree uh, to intervene in Libya at a time based on uh, the UN security resolutions. Now, we can, of course, debate uh, the success of what, what's happened in Libya, but nevertheless, the fact of the matter is that NATO adapted to the situation and moved to this decision-making process that was a lot quicker and a lot more efficient. So I'm hoping that the EU will do the same, that this is a, a wake-up call, that we have another, you know, just at the time when we thought that uh, there would be no territorial uh, defense uh, in Europe any longer, uh, just as we thought that there would be no more wars, and we've said that so many times, never again, but it does happen. So we do have to be ready for that. We do have to be ready to defend ourselves, uh, but also to work um, very actively how to politically resolve that crisis, because a military solution would be uh, just uh, horrible. It's, it's not the way out. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, questions are popping in uh, uh, one after the other, and uh, I've, I have to look at my screen once in a while, so please apologize. And one question comes no from, um, Mr. from from Gordon uh, uh, Kraus, and he was a Fulbrighter at the MCI uh, in 2020. And uh, I just read it because it's a little longer. You, you uh, Excellency, raised a very interesting point about the evolving U.S. relationship with the, the EU, which has previously been very strong at times. Given the strained relationship with the prior U.S. president promoting isolationism and the more recent fiasco in Afghanistan, calling into question the reliability of the U.S. as a partner in promoting democracy, how? should the EU engage with the US in terms of security and other cooperation? 
That is a long but a very pertinent question. Again, I, I will repeat what I said. You know, the EU ju cannot just assume that um, our interests or the interpretation of our re relationship will be uh, the same as that of the United States. I, we actually see um, now a huge divergence, a huge asymmetry of not just capabilities across the Atlantic, and the EU must work a lot more on our, on, on our capabilities. Uh, we don't see just um, an asymmetry of contribution, but we also see an asymmetry of expectations of what we expect of each other and what we expect of the transatlantic relationship. And uh, when, uh, with the change of the administration, when President Biden was uh, elected, uh, I think that everybody in the US saw that um, everybody in the EU uh, was excited and were hoping they welcomed the new administration and they were hoping for a turn in relations for, for a new a new era of mutual relationship. Now, the pandemic, again, has very much uh, affected that as well, because quite realistically, uh, you know, I know President Biden personally. I've known him for a number of years. He was in Zagreb when he was, uh, he was vice president. He cares deeply about what happens in Europe and what happens in Southeast Europe. He attended one of our Brdobrioni special meetings uh, of that process that is aimed at integrating Southeast Europe in the EU and NATO for those who want it. And I think he's really very honest when he wants to not just patch up that relationship across the Atlantic, but really uh, take you to another level and his initiative about uh, democracy and alliance of democracy and promoting democracy uh, around the world. I, I very, very much welcome that. Now, uh, realistically speaking, he has to concentrate very much on the domestic scene mm -hmm. in the US. Um, and uh, ever since he uh, came into office, he had to deal with a pandemic, uh, with the health system, uh, in the U.S., but also with the economic consequences of the pandemic. So that has taken a lot of his energy. And also the pandemic itself has prevented a lot of these in-person meetings that I can testify as someone who, who has attended a lot of those are hugely important uh, in uh, diplomatic relations and diplomatic world. For someone coming from Croatia, for instance, where you're mostly not a on the top of the agenda of uh, a lot of countries, because first you're not a big country, um, you don't hold resources such as oil, and you're not a problem country, so you know you're out there. But um, it takes a while to set up some meetings, etc. But these uh, international meetings, summits, were a huge opportunity to get a few minutes with a certain leader and. Um, agree on a lot of things that otherwise would have taken the diplomatic services months or even years to, to come to an agreement. So uh, the US reliability as a partner will still be tested. And, and as we have seen post-Afghanistan, uh, that situation was very much exploited by a third country saying, look, the US turned um, their back on you. Um, in, in together, out together, uh, the, the motto that we had in Afghanistan did not really work because the U.S. Uh, took a unilateral decision. And of course, I, I mentioned already that I worked uh, in Afghanistan. I visited the country so many times, spent so much time there on the ground. And I, you know, I see this, the, the whole intervention that we're doing was certainly not in vain. We gave a chance to those people, a chance that I hope we will preserve uh, in the future, working with a new regime under uh, certain conditions of their respect for the rights of women, uh, other minorities, etc. And uh, so I've seen huge progress and we were, I think that most European countries were um, disappointed uh, because of that decision since the pullout was very quick and uh, it turned out to be quite disorderly. Um, however, the fact of the matter is that that operation would have to be ended in any case. Uh, Afghanistan had to ultimately take uh, uh, the reins of their own future. Uh, but as I said, you know, they, they, I, this 
did cause a certain level of mistrust that was augmented by what third countries were saying about the re re reliability of the U.S. as a partner. Now, I am, um, the, I consider myself a really staunch transatlantic, transatlanticist. I think that the U.S. Um, and uh, the European Union or, or the European side of the transatlantic uh, alliance that we have to work together. It's mostly our values that bind us together. And we need to protect those values and we need to promote them further. And in all that, obviously, we'll have a lot more competition around the world. And I think we will have to do a lot more arguing and explaining of what the merits of democracy are, since because of that freedom of the media, there, uh, there are a lot of arguments in our own ranks that question whether this is uh, indeed uh, the best model. So I would hope that um, the U.S. will pay more attention to uh, the European side of the transatlantic relationship and that um, together we can work on these internal discords within the alliance. And as I said to me, um, I fear internal discords even more than external threats. I think that they are heavily corrosive. They undermine the basis of our mutual trust, which is um, preconditioned for defending ourselves, not just in military terms, but uh, from any other and danger or challenge that we see in the modern world. And I am optimistic about the future, but I have to warn that, you know, time is ticking. And uh, I'm afraid that some European citizens are getting disillusioned. We will need a bit more um, of, um, uh, of a stronger statement, not just rhetorical, but something that is followed by concrete steps from uh, the U.S. To, to restore that relationship. Mm -hmm. Although I must say, you know, we've seen, uh, we, we tried to uh, uh, sort of designate the Trump administration as the worst relationship ever. I mean, the, the transatlantic relationship has seen its good times and bad times, and we have always been able to overcome them. As I said, one of the biggest values of the Alliance is uh, uh, its adaptiveness mm -hmm. to the new circumstances. Uh, it has survived throughout the Cold War, the post-Cold War. It's now heading on strong, and uh, now we have to agree to go beyond uh, the, the threats that we had in the past, and that will require a um, high level of mutual agreement on the way forward. But I mean, some, somewhat because so many people um, have negative feelings about President Trump, and I do not uh, want to comment them. But uh, wasn't it um, wasn't it right that uh, President Trump uh, um, tried to encourage to be polite, to encourage the European Union uh, to to be strong on their own defense, uh, and uh, now it proves that uh, that we are lacking of of, of capabilities. So uh, actually, you know, there's very much emotion in such uh, political terms. Uh, but uh, if you see the, the pure argument, uh, you may also see a, a number of, uh, of um, let's say, plausible uh, arguments uh, which have been put forward at that time. Yes. Well, you know, when I was president from 2015 to, to uh, 2020, I would get a lot of questions about him insisting on the European uh, um, partners to step up uh, and uh, um, reduce that asymmetry of contribution and uh, uh, capabilities, which uh, sort of heavily swings towards the U.S. And as I said, you know, he's absolutely right to insist on that. Of course, we can um, talk about the rhetoric and the manner in which that was done, but this is something that um, we adhere to ourselves. The, those were the conclusions uh, of the summit in Wales, for instance, that every country will dedicate 2% of their GDP for defense um, investment. I don't like the word spending, it's defense investment. And it's, um, for me, it's like paying in the insurance. You never, uh, you know, life insurance or health insurance, you hope you're not going to need it, but when you do need it, it's there. So that's defense investment. 
which actually is also beneficial for uh, the, uh, the civilian sector because a lot of these technologies ultimately get their application in medicine and uh, in other industries. So he was absolutely right to do that. 2% uh, of GDP and then 20% of that for uh, technological development, not just for pensions or uh, salaries, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, I am encouraged by, to see what the EU or some EU member countries have been doing with PESCO, um, speaking about strategic autonomy. I don't see that. Um, as sort of a competition to NATO and the transatlantic relationship. I see that as vehicles on how to decrease um, the European dependence on EU cap uh, on uh, US capabilities. And you could see that, for instance, talking about Libya. In the beginning of the intervention in Libya, it was the US capabilities, um, surveillance technology, drones, et cetera, that were crucial for the operation. But then through the operation, the EU countries took the lead um, in terms of carrying out operations and everything else in the context of the mandate under the UN Security Council resolutions. So um, to see that Europe is thinking about strategic autonomy that does not include just defense uh, and uh, military, but also uh, other areas uh, such as health uh, and uh, uh, that re building the resilience of societies at home and abroad, uh, it's a good thing. And I also like the initiatives of President Macron mm -hmm. that also had towards uh, a stronger European force uh, presence. And I hope that we will build that. And um, I, I don't think um, that the U.S. should uh, be resentful of that because ultimately it is uh, in the context of what we have been trying to fight for years now, where some circles in the U.S. have called the EU members of NATO or the European members of NATO as free riders uh, on uh, U.S. technologies and capabilities. So we're working on that. Um, PES again, PESCO, I, I think, is, is, is good, especially for smaller countries that, that have to find these niche capabilities. Uh, and um, um, I do see uh, a much more of an autonomous role uh, for Europe in that. However, with uh, NATO still as the backbone of the transatlantic and European defense, not, not even questioning uh, the future of NATO or the existence of NATO mm -hmm. or its relevance. Now, looking at Southeast uh, Europe, um, and I have been receiving a question from uh, Federico Zoc. He is a long-standing friend of the MCI. He's in the wine business, so I may bring you together. Uh, it, it, <laughs> and he has sent me the question, why are some states uh, of, uh, of Southern Europe still not in the EU? Is it only mm -hmm. a question of so-called quote, missing European democracy? Oh, uh, you know, European accession process is so complicated. And since I, I was part of it for years as uh, the head of our national delegation for accession to the European Union, and in my various capacities, I could talk about it for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. Let me just say that it's, you know, the negotiations with the EU, as we call them, are not really negotiations uh, in uh, the sense uh, that we'll look at negotiations. So basically, if you negotiate about the number of seats that you get in the EU parliament, uh, the quota, the national quota, you negotiate about the money that you will be getting from the funding, but the rest of it is actually um, trying to mirror that system in your own country. So you have to adopt all of this a key communautaire that is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages of different legislation. And you need to harmonize your own system in 30 something chapters, depending on which country we're, we're talking about. And that means not just passing laws in the parliament, but it means implementation of those laws, building institutions, working on democratic institutions, fighting corruption, um, then uh, cleaning up uh, your judiciary system, uh, uh, 
not just in terms of corruption, but there are a lot of uh, cases that go on and on here in this part of the world. Then working on the market economy and being able to actually withstand the pressures of the market economy and of the huge, huge European market. So it, it really is a very complex uh, process. And some countries are doing better than others. As Croatia will be not just arguing politically for their integrations, as I said, you know, we're directly affected here. These dangerous vacuums uh, created are filled by others who at least confuse uh, people. Um, so we, we're not just helping politically these countries, but we're really working a lot with them on exchange of our own experience for that to be able to do some things a lot more quickly than we did uh, to avoid the same mistakes that we made, etc. But the the sentiment in the EU that is very uh, enlargement unfriendly, so enlargement fatigue has uh, affected this process. And uh, I'm I think that we should move these countries on these formal steps towards uh, the EU membership a lot more quickly. I think that most of them really deserve to move more quickly. So why are they still not in the EU? Um, I would say that um, the responsibility for that is mutual. You know, that the reform processes are not always perfect, but we haven't been perfect in keeping our own promises. Uh, and keeping our word and that in turn affects what what i mentioned earlier when i was concerned when uh, the support for eu membership in croatia was dropping because then you lose that uh, enthusiasm for uh, reform you um, start thinking about the cost of the reform and what you're really getting and uh, you're losing the side of of the membership so you become disillusioned and that also affects the way that you do things in the terms of fulfilling the criteria for membership. Very complex, but we have to reinforce that power of Europeanization and use it to the full extent. Now let's, lo uh, let's uh, move to the Olympics. Uh, you are uh, an, an IUC member. And I've been receiving questions, uh, a number of them, uh, regarding uh, the Olympic Games now, especially uh, taking place shortly in uh, Beijing. And one comes from Professor Thomas Osberg. Uh, he is an uh, adjunct faculty member of the MCI. And one actually goes, it goes very uh, closely together with uh, the question of Martin Hanser. He is a chief editor uh, of foreign policy issues at the Austrian press uh, agency. Uh, I hope I bring them together in a manner which is understandable. Now, the question of uh, Martin Hanser uh, is, as an IOC member, how do you assess the diplomatic boycott at, of the Olympic Games in Beijing by countries such as the United States, Great Britain or Japan in view of the serious human rights violations in China? And uh, now the the one of, uh, I may perhaps bring in the one of Professor Thomas Osberg. We see more and more attempts to boycott at various levels Olympics because of so-called misbehaviors, uh, for instance, human rights of the host states. What's your perspective on this? Yes, well, um, as an IOC member, actually, I should not comment at all because uh, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, maintains political neutrality uh, and uh, we do not comment on the decisions on particular, of particular countries about diplomatic or any other boycott. I just have to say that I'm happy that the Olympics will take place. Uh, I think that you know, we have to look at the Olympic Games um, as uh, one of the most um, powerful symbols of unity in the world. And after Tokyo, that happened with a one-year postponement, uh, China will again sort of testify to this resilience of human humanity to this virus that has so much upset our lives. Uh, and, you know, the motto of the Olympics uh, in China is together for a shared future. So we we should come together and, and look at the way how we will overcome these challenges that we have in common in spite of the differences that we have on the interpretation of democracy, of liberal democracy, of human rights, and in particular the issue of sovereignty and intervention or non-intervention in the internal affairs of any state and the question whether human rights 
are indeed an internal uh, matter or uh, they are a matter for the whole international community in order to protect the rights of all as per all these universal uh, conventions that we have all signed and, and ratified. Uh, the motto of the uh, uh, IOC was uh, changed actually in Tokyo. It's uh, not now just faster, higher, stronger. It's faster, higher, stronger together in order to uh, put emphasis on that work together, on solidarity. This is what we need uh, in the world to overcome uh, many, many, uh, many problems that we have. Now, um, a lot of people, and you see that in the media, a lot of uh, commentators question whether the IOC should remain politically neutral. Of course, the charter um, says that uh, the international Olympic movement is aimed at creating harmonious development of the humankind. And obviously, uh, human rights and the rights of every individual are an important element uh, in, in all of that. However, there's also you know, the, the importance of the Olympic truce resolution, for instance, uh, which uh, uh, was always a way for countries that were even at war to stop that war and to come together at the Olympics to try to demonstrate that we're all human and that uh, we have to come together in order to be resolve uh, our uh, our biggest problems uh, in the world uh, in addition to being a member of the ioc i'm also chair of the future hosts commission so that is the commission that gives recommendations we lead the process with the potential hosts with interested parties, and we give recommendations to our executive board, to the president, to the session, uh, ultimately. Uh, we have started to look at human rights record a lot more closely, and it will become, it has become an important aspect of what we want to do. And we've changed the whole process of selection of the hosts of, of the Olympics in terms of, you know, we don't want for this to be a very expensive adventure for any country and investing money into these stadiums and sports arenas just for the sake of the Olympics. This isn't possible any longer. Now, what we insist now is that uh, countries or, or, or cities use the existing infrastructure and that anything else that we, uh, will be built is in line with the long-term development plans of a certain community so that it serves the community and not the Olympic Games. In addition to that, we put a very heavy emphasis on legacy, what kind of legacy this will bring, not just when it comes to sports competition, but also inclusion, for instance. Mm -hmm. Inclusion of people who are disadvantaged in any way, whether they be socially or perhaps because they have some kind of disability. Inclusion of minorities, um, inclusion of women, but other minorities as well. So, so these are all very, very important aspects. And of course, sustainability has become a huge aspect. So uh, looking at the games uh, ahead of us, uh, they must be uh, climate neutral or they will be actually climate positive and uh, carbon uh, neutral and, and carbon positive in terms of uh, looking uh, at the Olympics in a lot, a lot lighter aspect than uh, just, uh, just games, just sports. Uh, they need to reinforce values as well. So now when we look at interested parties, we also look at um, third independent party assessment. We ask for that assessment. And we also look at different indices, such as uh, human security index or human rights index, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we want to send a message to everyone that this is, the responsible thing to do, looking at human rights, that it's it's an interest of all to improve uh, the the human rights and uh, to use the Olympic Games as a vehicle in doing that. And in that sense, the, um, the International Olympic Committee wants to be a partner with all of these interested parties, whether they will host the Olympic uh, Games ultimately or not. Maybe they'll host some other kind of 
big sports event, but we want to be a partner in helping these countries overcome uh, the present situation, the present hurdles. Now, with the to come go. To go back to Beijing, of course, um, uh, the Olympics were awarded to Beijing years ago. I think it was the time of the Obama administration, for instance. Uh, in the uh, United States, um, the process is very complicated. You can't just take that away or, you know, the IOC cannot just, it would be completely um, unacceptable for the IOC just to take a decision that is not based on the merit of the process and the way that the process should go because then we would contravene our own principles of transparency, openness and giving a, a fair chance to everyone. But you know looking at the, the Olympic Games in Beijing obviously um, not a lot of people will come simply because of the COVID restrictions and, and the situation. But this isn't political participation and you know being in Be Beijing at the Olympics uh, will not be making a political statement. It will be making a statement in the support of our common humanity, of our uh, common future. And for athletes, there, there were discussions um, earlier um, uh, last year that some countries may boy boycott the Olympics altogether, but in that sense, you only punish the athletes. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of athletes, uh, the Olympics are the crown achievement of their careers. And as you know, athletes, uh, active athlete uh, careers are very limited in terms of uh, their duration and the number of years. And they plan everything to participate in the Olympics they um, work for that their whole lives um, and you know denying them that opportunity to participate in the olympics uh, would just harm uh, our own athletes uh, and this is what we were arguing and i, and I think that everybody everybody uh, accepts that and again when it comes to diplomatic boycott it's um, a decision of uh, every individual country and uh, uh, this isn't uh, something that we will get into uh, when it comes to this guy. It's every country's right to take their own decisions. Now, we've been exploiting your time, but if you can dedicate some more minutes, uh, I, I would bring in one, two, three more questions. And I'll try to be brief in my answers. <laughs> the one is um, uh, now. Uh, would you see a development uh, come um, on the horizon uh, that uh, there may be the, the Olympic decision making or the selection process may be just uh, um, combined with an index, call it humanity rights index, uh, sustainability index. And if you do not reach uh, on an independent index, and uh, if you do need, uh, if you don't reach a certain uh, level of uh, points, you you cannot be uh, accepted as a host country. Would you see such a a development uh, in in the near or in the longer future? Yes, absolutely. We're doing that already. In the process now, when we're evaluating the interested party for uh, the future uh, games, we are looking and uh, it has been made more than clear to all the interested parties that we're looking at these indices of human rights, of um, human security, of uh, the development, of the sustainability. So we're looking um, uh, at the human dimension and we're looking also at the the natural dimension the preservation of uh, our of the environment okay uh, then um, one argue, uh, one question not an argument comes uh, from uh, the United Kingdom from London uh, it's uh, from a friend of uh, the MCI and uh, his name is mr. Mahinda Kari and he has sent me the question, do you think if, uh, if uh, the Ukraine crisis ha had occurred at the time of the Brexit uh, campaign and, and polls, the, uh, the, the Brexit would have taken place? That is an interesting question, but I must say that there, there was a crisis. There, there has been a crisis in Ukraine for quite a while, mm -hmm. um, ever since the referendum and annexation of uh, the Crimea and uh, the, the developments in, in some uh, parts of Ukraine, the uh, amassing of uh, the military force. So uh, 
now we all we of course see the escalation that's difficult to say whether brexit would have happened certainly brexit to a certain extent was a response to external circumstances mm -hmm. at the time some some of the other threats and challenges that the eu was dealing with and most notably migration and maybe not migration uh, as much as our um, discussion on migration and, and lack of solidarity that we saw, that kind of solidarity that has to go multiple ways, as I mentioned. I must say that I regret that the UK has left the European Union. I'm very fond of the UK uh, and um, I don't know, maybe at some point in the future the people will decide to come back because um, the the relationship um, or the past of UK in the EU was quite turbulent. This wasn't the first referendum. There were several referenda earlier, and uh, the UK could have joined even earlier had not some of the referenda failed. So there, there was always this balancing act. But certainly, you know, the UK is not a ship that will say, sail away from uh, Europe. Uh, it's uh, a series of islands that is there to stay, and we have to continue building our relationship. Uh, I haven't been to London um, in about two years, but I hope to come back. I love London, but I love the whole of the UK. Perhaps the last the set of questions can be uh, more or less answered also in the more word la word wrap uh, style because they come from one lady. She's an MCI student uh, named Vanessa Kessler, and uh, she um, she asks now. This is a number of questions. How was it for you to be the first female president in Croatia? Oh, it was very exciting. Of course, I was deeply honored, but it was also rather difficult. It's still very difficult for women to be taken seriously mm -hmm. out there in any society. I talked a lot to my female colleagues and we all we all had similar problems. It seems that women are looked through a different type of lens than men in uh, not just in politics but in business and, and in other uh, male dominated areas. Um, so it's like you know you put uh, glasses with the wrong prescription and then you look at someone so you you everything is distorted but first of all everybody tends to focus on our physical appearance and the first news was always what i wore what kind of hairstyle how much i weighed and there were a lot of uh, sexist comments even hate speech based on um, my gender um, on the other hand, I tried to do as much as I could in order to promote um, the, the gender equality in Croatia. It was a very difficult uh, path to tread. I mean, uh, you, you mentioned uh, I pushed a lot of glass ceilings, or what I prefer to say, I, I walked a lot of glass labyrinths uh, in order to find my way out. Uh, and being the first was not always easy. You carry a huge responsibility and you, you know, you always have that um, gender stereotype effect that you're afraid that you're going to be the one to prove the stereotype that's out there. And then they do everything they can in order to uh, make you believe that you've actually done it. So what happened specifically to me, and I, I just talked to a journalist the other day here in Croatia, um, I came from NATO and um, there was a perception that I was someone uh, who uh, could really be tough and you know um, got around well in this male dominating uh, dominated arena so as soon as I came back to Croatia somebody um, leaked into the press the so-called action plan Barbie which was nonsense it was all sorts of things that were not true but the point was to uh, frame the discussion in the tone of barbie and what barbie means so just a stupid blonde or a stupid not or not so intelligent woman uh, who's uh, there just to make an appearance etc and i see you know when i look at the discussion today about um, the census and the fact that we've lost hundreds of thousands of people in croatia in the past years and decades when I look at the level of that uh, discussion and when I talked about it as president and the papers that I wrote personally, 
that are almost like a mini master or PhD thesis, just without the bibliography. When I look at the level of what I wrote and the level of discussion today post-census, I realize that sometimes it was maybe even difficult for uh, people to understand because they did not have that deep knowledge of the subject. So whatever you say, they take out of context, they twist it around, or they simplify it in the case of the, uh, demographic, my demographic strategy at the time, how much will it all cost? Because this is something that they can talk about. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, my question would be how much does the future cost? And you can't get, a, get around that. So the, as women, we still uh, encounter so much prejudice, so much sexism. I've learned to deal with it. And um, of course, yeah, when somebody says something that is hate speech based on, on your gender, of course, it stings you a little. But um, through the time, I've learned to deal with it in the sense of, okay, I just stopped thinking about it. However, what, what I was concerned about is what kind of example it gives in society. Because most people think that as president, you are protected, which is actually not the truth. You're very vulnerable. So apart from physical protection, you're not protected when it comes to the media, when it comes to all sorts of offenses, uh, criticism, etc. But people think that you are protected, that the state protects you. And if they see that people offend me as president based on my gender, based on the fact that I am a woman and dress like a woman, imagine what kind of behavior that will foster in their communities with women who uh, are dependent on those men either through economic means or because they're their bosses or fathers or teachers, etc. So it provokes a culture of impunity and a culture that is very offensive, not just to women, but other minorities and other individuals as well. However, I did not claim that as when I was president, for me, as I did not want for public to interpret that well, she's looking for an excuse why she's not successful. But now that I'm not president any longer, I will speak about that a lot more openly. And I will fight for all the women and girls and all the other disadvantaged people, whatever they may call themselves, to um, make it easier for them than it was for our generation. Very touching. Thank you for sharing this uh, insight, this very personal insight. Uh, how many hours did you work on an average a week uh, during your presidency? And do you miss working in politics? Well. Um, First question, 24-7, really. And when I, I, I mentioned that, that um, strategy on uh, the demographic strategy on uh, demographic development, I stayed at my office for 10 days. I did not leave my office. I slept there. I slept with papers and computers all over that. I barely had uh, you know, room to sleep, and I slept for one, two, three hours per night until I was finished with that project. But they, there were many occasions like that. So sometimes I wouldn't even go to sleep. Sometimes I would catch a few hours. Um, definitely it does wear you out, but without it, without uh, working hard, which I did throughout my whole life, and as I said, for women, you always have to do a lot more in order to be regarded uh, equally uh, competent as a man for the same work that you do. So, um, Ever since I was a kid, I used to read a lot, work a lot at school, um, at the university, work several jobs alongside um, studying in order to help my parents and uh, ultimately to make it not just as a woman, but as a young person in the national and international service, you have to put in a lot of effort, a lot of work. And you have to work on yourself. You have to continue your education, academic or specialized training. Uh, and you have to also pay back and contribute to your society as well. So it's not just the formal work that we do at our office, but also working to change our communities that matter. Final question that uh, this question comes from. The politics, sorry, I don't miss domestic politics. Now, I miss the uh, adrenaline. Um, I missed, I did travel a lot last year though, 
Um, I miss the international arena, international security, etc. But I don't miss domestic politics. Politics, not not at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And my my question, my final question to close also the this event is: Is there any specific advice, or maybe two or three, to the young generation, especially perhaps to our students? Is there something you really want to share with them, which uh, which you think is very important? Yes, I had a lot of ups and downs in my life. There were moments when I felt triumphant, and then there were moments when I felt miserable. And there are two important things to uh, be aware of and to know. First of all, is that no situation will last forever. It will change, there will be an opportunity for change. And the second is that the bad times are there for us to be able to appreciate the good times, to have that lessons learned process, and to avoid the mistakes that we did in the past. We like to say, don't cry over the spilt milk, and it's no, really no use crying. We just have to assess and reassess what we did, but at one point, just to draw the line and move forward, because you know you can't read a book if you just keep rereading the same chapter or, or going back to the same chapters. You have to move on, you have to look forward, you have to look out outward and use every opportunity you can in order to uh, to uh, make take that step forward because every fall is an opportunity for a new beginning for a new step up and that truly is the case in life excellency president uh, kolinda graba kitarovic thank you so much for sharing your views uh, uh, sharing your experience giving us insight into your feeling into into your feelings into your emotions and all, all what it takes to uh, to uh, to pursue your career and what you have been experiencing thank you so much for sharing uh, this uh, uh, these views with our community with our audience and um, i really i give you the word at the, at the, at the very end again uh, I just wanted to uh, thank our partners, uh, thank our team, thank our technicians, uh, thank our alumni associations, uh, thank especially uh, Ms. Bettina Stichauner. She, she is just a really a wonderful person chairing and leading this, uh, these, uh, this series of uh, distinguished guest lectures. So thank you so much uh, for everyone contributing to this, uh, to, to this series. And uh, if you, uh, before you then uh, log off, um, I may uh, announce two distinguished guests uh, who are uh, already on screen on our agenda. The one is Matthias Ulbrich, he's Vice President uh, of Information Technology, so the CIO of Porsche uh, Worldwide in Stuttgart. And he will be with us on February 14th, 5 p.m., talking about digital transformation at Porsche what to learn from such a journey. And on Wednesday, the uh, February the, 30, uh, the 23rd uh, at 5.30 p.m., we will uh, welcome uh, Mr. Brecken Darrell. He's the chief executive of Logitech International uh, sitting in Newark, California. What does it take to become a leader? So highly topical topics. Thank you so much uh, again for uh, for sharing and for uh, uh, sharing your views with the MCI, Madame Colinda. You want you want to close the event? Well, of course, I'd like to thank you again for your kind invitation, and of course, uh, my uh, thanks and appreciation go to everyone who's made uh, this uh, uh, dialogue, the session possible. I would have so much preferred to have been in person. Uh, there uh, with you, as um, I do believe in social contact and human conversation. And for me, it's a, it's, it's a lot easier, a lot more pleasant, and I think a lot more productive when we can see each other's faces, see people's reactions, to uh, know whether you're boring them or uh, to see where, where you're going, and to give them a, an opportunity to ask these questions directly. 
and um, you know most importantly after the event so just uh, uh, to hang around together uh, to network to make new friends uh, to stay in touch and to continue working together so I'm so much looking forward to seeing you all in person next time Thank you so much. Uh, all the best for your for your next steps, uh, for your trip to Beijing, for your ongoing career, and we strongly look forward uh, to welcoming you on campus here in Innsbruck, Austria. I wish you a very very pleasant evening. Enjoy and relax from this dialogue. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and all the best to everyone. Thank you.